Okay, so welcome everybody to our 10th seminar in the Algebra, Particles, and Quantum Theory seminar series. I'm pleased to welcome back tonight's speakers, Corinne Minogue and Tevian Dre. Corinne and Tevian are professors at Oregon State University in the departments of physics and mathematics, respectively. They are also both um, APS fellows. Corinne received her PhD at the University of Texas and then went on to become a member at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, a postdoc at the University of Durham, and an Indo-American fellow at both the Institute of Mathematical uh, Sciences in Madras and the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in Bombay. Tevian uh, received his PhD at UC Berkeley and uh, also followed by a membership at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, a postdoc at Freie Universität in Berlin, a postdoc in Utrecht with Gerard Hooft, a postdoc um, at the University of York, and also an Indo-American fellowship at both the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Madras and the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. If you pull up their CVs, you'll find an extensive list of awards that demonstrates how dedicated to physics and mathematics education both Corinne and Tevian have been throughout their careers. This includes initiating the Paradigms in Physics project for which Corinne is the principal investigator. Tevian and Corinne have been actively working on the octonions longer than any of us. They are world uh, experts on this topic and even wrote a book not long ago called The Geometry of the Octonions. Tonight, they're gonna to be telling us about their recently released model relating the standard model to E8. Now, before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that everybody who showed up here today is here to learn. And so I hope that everyone feels comfortable enough to raise their hand and ask a question throughout the talk if they have one. If you accidentally ask a silly question, it's not a big deal. You just brush yourself off and try again next time. I would especially like to encourage questions from graduate students, upper level undergraduates and postdocs. Okay, so Corinne, anytime you're, you're ready to go. Good, thank you so much, Cole. Um, I really, uh, want to thank you and express how much I, I in particularly appreciate the the friendly and global aspects of, of what you're trying to do here because I think that both of those things are in contrast to the traditional uh, physics culture and um, uh, thank you. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm very excited that um, that you and Tevin are are um, releasing your uh, your new paper for us. Uh, you know, if, you know, for the first time. So I, I feel like we we've been very lucky to have you as speakers. Yeah, I think you know so many of us have who particularly who work on the Octonians have suffered from doing that in various <laughs> ways. Um, and has made all of us a little bit gun shy. And, and I, I will admit that I am nervous about giving this talk, but not so much here because, because of the, the culture you're initiating. So I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, uh, I particularly want to thank um, Rob Wilson, who is here. He is a co-author on the paper, um, but wasn't particularly responsible for the way Tevian and I mushed it together into a talk. Um, but but much of the, the uh, work represented in the paper and that I'll be talking about here is 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 due to him. Um, I also particularly um, want to thank David Fairley and Tony Sudbury who got me started on this work um, back in 1985. Uh, David was a um, uh, uh, on sabbatical at the Institute for Advanced Study where I was a postdoc and he very much took me under his wing and introduced me to the um, to the Octonians um, at that stage and a little bit later Tony Sudbury um, uh, also really mentored me in those early stages and much of the work that I'll be talking about here goes back um, all those decades but but many thanks to them. Um, on this slide, you'll also see the long list of people that have supported us and or collaborated with us in various ways um, on the work that's um, in this project. You'll see that this is a very big holistic thing. It's taken us many years to get to this stage um, and the work of all of these people is, is relevant. Um, so. So I want to describe everything that I'm talking about today in terms of, um, I'm calling it a research agenda 
but I might as well have called this uh, our philosophical commitment. Um, so I'm going to keep track. I'm going to add to this list as I go through the talk so you can see where it is that we've made various choices. Um, so in particular, um, we're going to try and fit the standard model of physics into um, a version, a real version of E8. And by that, I mean, we're going to talk, we're going to try and put in the symmetries of the standard model um, and both the fermions and the mediators. We are not going to try and put in gravity or superstrings or symmetry. Um, I started my work with the Octonians during the um, 80s, during the super, that superstring revolution. Um, and so my early work was all trying to put superstring stuff in here. Um, other people, um, uh, Peter West is here. He emailed us and, and reminded me of a paper of his. His claim is he was the first person to try and put um, some model of physics into E8 um, back in, I think that was 83. Um, but he was doing very much supergravity things. Um, Rob Wilson, our collaborator in particular now, is really interested in trying to put gravity into things as is Tajindra. I don't know whether he's here, but he has been here in many of the talks. Um, so if you want, if you're trying to do gravity with Octonians, I will refer you to them. Um, but we're trying to just do this very focused, the, the standard model in, in a version of E8. Um, many other people in this group, including Cole, are trying to put the standard model into Octonianic-like things. Uh, in Cole's case, our uh, tensor, our tensor C, tensor H, tensor O, um, which is, uh, has a lot, a lot of overlap, as you'll see with this E8, but has some like crucial signs that are different. And um, one of the things that all of us are struggling with is how to get all of the signs right in, in our model. So, but our commitment is to E8. Um, our second commitment is that we will use mathematicians conventions for the Lie algebra so that everything in the, because everything is inside of E8, everything is anti-Hermitian, which is really uncomfortable for physicists and, um, and caused us, it was like my doubts as a physicist about whether I wanted to deal with anti-Hermitian things held us up for many years. Um, and so that will be a part of, of this talk. Um, and then the other commitment is that it's really, really important to pay attention to the signature of the E8 that you're working with. So in particular, um, there is a real form of E8, which is totally compact, but you can't put, Lorenz, you can't put time into that unless you complexify all of E8. And so a really important commitment for us is to not complexify E8 itself um, because it, there, uh, it hides some signs that the signs that are forced on to you by not complexifying um, are I think hints to where the standard model lives inside of all of this. Um, so our two choices, there are, I am not, sorry, I'm looking for my mouse on multiple screens. Can you see my mouse? Yes? Yes, yeah. Okay, so, um, so there are three real forms of E8. Um, we call this one the half split one, and this is fully split in a way that'll be clear in another slide or two. We tried really hard to put in the, um, the standard model into this completely split E8 case. Um, and we were not able to do that, but this is, this is a choice that we made. And if we're wrong by in some subtle ways, um, this might be an active place for people to explore. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that slide. So uh, in the last talk, Tevin talked about the magic squares, which are this way of, of building three by three representations um, for various groups. And the whole point of the magic squares 
is that these exceptional Lie algebras, F4, E6, E7, and E8, um, appear in the magic square. So what the magic square does as a review um, or, or a summary for those of you who were not at the last talk is that you take two division algebras. Um, so one element of reals, the complexes, the quaternions and the octonions, and another one for us, these primes are indicating split versions of those division algebras. But you take two division algebras and you build three by three um, objects out of the tensor product of things in those two division algebras, and you get all of these lovely groups, in, including the exceptional, sorry, the exceptional Lie algebras. Um, Tevian also, and so when I say half split, the version of E8 that we're using is um, a division algebra and a split division algebra. If you do the totally compact case, it's a division algebra and a division algebra, and that has no uh, boosts in it. Um, and the fully split case would be where both these and these are elements of split division algebras. So we're looking at this version of E8 in the half split magic square. Um, Tevian also talked to you about how there's a two by two version of the magic square. Um, also labeled by the, the two division algebras, but these are two by two matrix structures rather than three by three matrix structures. And these matrix structures sit inside of the three by three case. Um, and so in particular, if we're looking at this version of E8, we're looking at SO12.4 as the two by two version. Um, what the magic square doesn't tell you is how each of the smaller division, the, the smaller um, Lie algebras sits inside of E8. So to do that, you see various Lie algebras in here, but you also have to look at what are their centralizers in E8. The paper that we've released is taking a particular stroll through the magic square, building up to E8, trying to explain what we believe are the physics properties of each of these steps through the magic square. But as you move through the magic square, you have to think not only of the Lie algebra that you're looking at, but also what its centralizer is to see how all of the E8 acts on, on the various um, things. The, um, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, so the, the path that you chose through here, um, uh, is it meant to, is there supposed to be some physical meaning attached to, to this path or have you just set it up this way in order to um, explain it in the clearest possible way? So we think that, that this path is highlighting particular physics structures um, at each step as you go through that path. Um, in this talk, I'm going to do it the other way. I'm going to start at E8 and break down into the smaller structures and show you the same physics, but I'll show you the physics of each small structure. As if I can jump in for just a second, uh, Cole, uh, you can sort of see a physics answer to that question if you look at the table at the bottom, which talks about the two by two structures in the middle and the centralizers on the right. And I don't think Corinne's going to do it now, but you can identify various standard model groups in those two columns. Okay, but the, uh, but um, you're using it to highlight different features within E8, but you're not, um, but am I right in saying that you're not um, saying, for example, that there's a symmetry breaking that kind of takes you down down this path? Like you wouldn't no, I'm exactly telling you there's a symmetry breaking that takes you down this path. A physical, a, a physical one that you would expect, like with the, you know, with Higgs mechanisms taking you from one to the other, or? Yeah, if you hadn't put the words Higgs mechanisms in there, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll talk about the, it, you can ask me about the Higgs at the very end, okay. but yes, absolutely. I think it is a, it is a physics symmetry breaking, not a mathematics symmetry breaking. Okay. And so trying to so the, the magic square tells you these mathematics things, but 
today we're trying to tell you the physics story that maps exactly onto this math story. Okay. So, yes. Okay. Okay. So um, the most important thing to emphasize at this stage in the game is that um, the the two by two magic squares, or if I if I think of this as a three by three matrix, here's a two by two matrix, um, which has the the two by two things in the magic square in it. So here's SO twelve four, and this is then a two component column with entries in division algebra, tensor division algebra prime. But um, this, the two by two thing really acts as a spin representation. I got used to calling them SOs, but these are really spin 12-4 acting on these things as spinners. Um, and then to make it anti-hermitian, if this is a spinner, this is minus the spinner dagger here. And in E8, um, the three three component is zero, but in some of the smaller splittings, you'll see um, some three three components pop into here um, that because of triality or undoing triality or something like that. So, um, yeah, are there any other questions right now or? I think I mostly need to go on to make sense of the words that I've been trying to, to say. So um, now I've added to the research agenda or the philosophy that we're going to decompose E8 into subalgebras and, and their centralizers in a way that will reveal um, the physics of E8. So let's start by looking at um, the decomposition of SO124. Um, so E8 contains SO. Let me go back up here. Let me say one more thing. I really want to emphasize that the, the two by two magic square is a spin group. And then all of the rest of the things in the um, in the three by three Lie algebra, in the three by three magic square, are a spinner representation of whatever it is that you're putting here. And the whether or not this spinner representation is Majorana or Vile or both or neither depends on whether um, this al Lie algebra has naturally Majorana or vile things. So everything that you've seen in the sort of spinorial chessboard all plays out here in the relationship between the two by two and the three by three magic square. So, um, so we're gonna decompose the two by two thing, the SO124, and then the spinners are gonna go along for the ride. So E8 is, is spin 12-4 and a spinner representation of it. Sorry, I'm having a technical problem. Um, but SO124 then can be decomposed into an SO2 and an SO31 and SO73. And note the funny signature. This is trying to be an SO10 for an SO10 gut. So here's Lorentz. And here's the gut SO10 like thing, but it has a funny signature. And I've said you have to respect the signature. Um, but what happens is that this extra SO2 here can become a complex structure on the spinners. So this complex structure makes the spinners complex and it allows you to not worry about the SO, the signature of the SO73 too much acting on the spinners. Um, so even though we're taking, keeping the E8 real and we're not complexifying it, by taking this extra SO2 out of the 12-4, we get an SO31 and then everything else is complexified. Okay. 
So let me tell you just uh, pedagogically a little bit about the rules about decomposing SON or SUN. So if I have an, uh, an SO group uh, with dimension P plus Q, and now I'm ignoring signature. So P may have some signature and Q may have some signature and just in these formulas, let the signatures go along for the ride. But SOP plus Q decomposes into an SOP plus an SOQ plus P times Q extra things, which become representations of both the SOP and the SOQ. And this will be central to how we identify the mediators later in the day. In a similar way, the SU groups, SUP plus Q, decomposes into an SUP and an SUQ, and then a, a, a rep that's P by Q, but it's complex because these are SU groups. So it's two times P times Q, and an extra U1 that tells you about the rotations in this space, the, com the complexness in this space. These rules have degenerate cases where Q is equal to one. So SOP plus one just becomes SOP plus a rep. SUP plus one becomes SUP plus two reps and a, and a complex structure. Um, there's also um, a particular version of this that combines the two rules, if you like, because SO6 is isomorphic to SU4, SO6 divides up into an SU3 and a two by three and an extra U1. So those are just some things to remember for later. But there's a similar decomposition of these three by three things in the division algebras. So now what I wanna do is talk to you about and color, and I mean color in the physics, the particle physics sense, the decomposition of E8. So with the, for color, we really want an SU3 to be color. And so if I take E8 and I sort of pull out an SU3, the thing that centralizes SU3 in E8 is E6. But it turns out that there are two different ways to do that, to do that decomposition. So you can decompose the E8 into an E6 with this signature and a compact SU3. And, or you can decompose E8 into an E6 with this signature and a split real form of SU3, SL3R. We're gonna take this route here so that's our commitment. Um, a recent paper by Chester, Moran, and Rios, at least some of whom may be here, were taking the opposite route here. So they, they were doing this splitting rather than this splitting. And that's a choice. And, and we struggled a lot with which one of these did we want to do for like, I don't know five or maybe even 10 years, which it went back and forth between these two choices. We've now settled on this choice for, um, but it does mean that color, it, this split version of SU3 for color um, will have presumably some observable consequences for, for the theory. Um, well, there's the other thing I need to say is that when you do these decompositions, now we're doing a decomposition of E6 and SL3R, and then you get the things that are representations of both E6 and SL3R, right? So you get six Jordan algebras. Jordan algebras as normally thought about are, are real, uh, are real, are Hermitian. These are anti-Hermitian, but they're anti-Hermitian because they pick up um, labels from the SL3R that what makes them anti-Hermitian is how they fit together as reps of SL3R. But there's a fundamentally Hermitian Jordan algebra sitting inside of that 
but there's six of them. So decades ago, um, when we were first doing this work, we looked at E6 acting on a single Jordan algebra. And we wanted that E6 to be electroweak acting on leptons because we had only one Jordan algebra. Um, and so lots of people have been doing Jordan algebra like things like this and looking at E6. And all of us were like almost correct in the sense that E6 does act on Jordan algebras, but the Jordan algebras are actually the ones that contain quarks and gluons and not the leptons that we thought they did. Um, so that's a kind of interesting aside. Um, so I'm not gonna talk in much more about these Jordan algebras or the color sector. I'll come back to it really briefly at the end of my talk. What I really want to talk to you today about is, is E6. So when we're decomposing um, E6 into, sorry, E8 into E6, the two by two structure is SO12-4 becomes SO91 plus 10 by six and this SO33, and that decomposes into the SL3R and a, and a three by two. And this one element of E8, which um, we call SL for whatever reasons. So this is the two by two decomposition, but the three by three decomposition that goes along with that is that the E8 decomposes into an E6. So here's the two by two SO91 sitting inside of E6. Um, this 10 by six is part of the Jordan algebras down here. Um, and, the, and here's the SL3R in E8. But when you do this breaking of, of color to SL3R, the spinners, become our Majorana vial spinners of both SO91 and SO33. So one of the reasons we made this choice is that SO91 and SO33 are both signatures that have Majorana vial spinners. And so the 128 spinner components in E8 break up into 16s of SO91 and then there are two singlets and a three and a three bar of uh, SO3 of the SL3R. So these spinners go into the color Jordan algebras. These vectors of SO91 also go into the Jordan algebra. So here's these and here's those. These spinners go into E6. So these are the lepton spinners and these are the quark spinners. So the quark spinners are transforming under the SL3R and the lepton spinners that are in E6 now, these are singlets of the SL3R. And so now we have E6 is the SO91, the two by two part of it, the two single, the two 16s spinners that are singlets of color. So these will be the leptons. And the really important thing here is that to build E6, this SL has to like, which is this SL, which is the, the U1 part of the SO33, when you split the SO33 into an SU3 and a U1, this runs from where it is here all the way over and ends up in the E6. So to make E6 close, you have to have the SO91 and this SL and the two spinners. So as you're doing the splitting, some U1s move sort of like back and forth between groups so that the, 
the subgroups that are in the magic square have um, that that mathematical structure is telling you that it's this particular U1 that has to be in this E6 structure. All right. So now everybody's getting lost in the, uh, I can see the coal is, it, it gives me wonderful faces. Like she's thinking really hard. Um, so I wanted to just talk, so we're, we're decomposing the subalgebras into subalgebras and their centralizers. And I, as a physicist at this stage, I get like totally lost. So Tevian and Rob are busy talking in this like abstract land and which representations are what. And um, for like my whole career, I've gotten really frustrated with mathematicians when they tell you there's a mapping from this space to this space. And I'm like, yes, what exactly, what is the mapping? What does it take from here to here? And until I can make it concrete in those ways, I can't keep track of it. And so what we have done, we have like dozens of whiteboards around the house where we're taking the 248 things that are in E8 and actually labeling them so I can watch them as they move from place to place. And sometimes they're on whiteboards and sometimes they're actually on index cards. You can't see it, but on the floor behind me are a whole bunch of index cards laid out trying to, to do E6 index cards on pieces of paper so that I can move them around in various ways. So now what I want to do for those of you who are physicists like me, and you really want to like see the concrete things, um, I'm going to show you how to label everything with the division algebras and how the division algebra structure, you don't have to use it. Rob doesn't <laughs> particularly use it. But for me, the division, labeling things with the division algebras helps me see which things are parts of which things. So here are the rules for doing it. The first thing is you need a labeling for the octonians and the split octonians. And so for us, the octonians are labeled one i, j, k for quaternions. And then we have a special octonionic unit L that we'll put in the middle. So our other labels are KL, JL, IL, and L. So these four things are the quaternions, and then these are the uh, extra things that you add to be octonions. And you see that they all have this extra like L label. Um, so one way of seeing the quaternions sit inside this labeling of the octonians is this set. But there's another set, which is, of course, in this diagram, any line gives you a quaternionic set. So there's also the set um, 1i, uh, l, and il is also a quaternionic set, or j and jl, or k and kl. So it's easy to see quaternions sitting inside of this structure in various ways. If you want to do the split octonians, um, you can draw the same kind of diagram. Um, and now we use uh, U and capital letter labels, I, J, K, K, L, J, L, and I, L. But if you're using the diagram, if you've got any line um, that has uh, two L labeled things in it. The L's are, are the boost like things. If you have any line with two L's in it, you have to reverse the direction of the arrow. Um, and then you get a, a split octonionic multiplication table. Um, so here are, here are labels for octonians and our labels for split octonians. And now we're going to label the things in E8. So here are the things that are, uh, we'll label Ds for a diagonal, and then X, Ys, and Zs for the various off diagonal positions. Anything with a D or an X label is in the, is in the two by two magic square. 
And the Zs and Ys are, are labels for the spinners that go with them. Um, so you can see the minus daggers to make, uh, to make sure that everything is anti-hermission. Um, so the SO12-4, um, we have an explicit basis labeled with Ds and Xs that consists of rotations or boosts in a single plane. Any, if something is going to be a boost, it will have a label in the split part of the split octonian. So it'll have labels L, IL, JL, KL. And on these Ds and Xs, the two labels that you have tell you which plane you're rotating or boosting in. So DIJ is a rotation between the I direction and the J direction. Um, we often use things with single indices, but the single index is, it's really a double index. We tend not to write the one or the U from the octonians. Um, so if there's ever just a single index, the other index is either a one or a U. Um, for the Ds to be in E8, both indices have to be either in O or in O prime. So for these diagonal things, for the spinner, for the X's and Y's and Z's, you get one index in O and one index in O prime. And so then all of the boosts and rotations in SO12-4 have this form, um, but the spinners all have one index in O and one index in O prime, and they're labeled with Y's and Z's. Then there are some rules for how do you do the commutators. So the commutators of uh, any two things in SO12-4 in the adjoint are, it's the commutators of rotations that you know. So if I'm taking a rotation in the IJ plane and a rotation in the JK plane, the commutators, because they share a common axis, the um, you end up with a rotation in the IK plane, the other two indices. So the adjoint SO12-4, the Ds and Xs, the commutator rules are like this. For the spinners, the commutator rules are, if I take something in SO12-4 with its two indices, and I take a Y or a Z, with its indices one in O and one in O prime, then what you do is whatever indices you have here, essentially you, you multiply the relevant index in the spinner by those labels. Um, and I've just given you, like you, you have to do it a little more carefully than that. Here's a, this one's a particularly true example, but uh, you have to take, you have to think about bars and things carefully. Um, but at any rate, there, there are really two multiplication rules, one for whether you're in adjoint SO12-4 and one for whether you're doing 12-4 with a spinner. Um, the other mathematical structure that we need, I won't talk about it much today, is that you have a, um, a killing, you have, um, a killing uh, metric, um, all of the 248 things that we've initially written down are their own killing duels. But this SL that I told you about before, this one um, E8 element that plays this funny role in E6 is a, is a linear combination in the split division algebras it's um, the, the boost of I with IL plus the boost of J with JL plus the boost of K with KL. But because of triality, it, you can write it in terms of a matrix structure, which is LL minus 2L. So here's the first place where you see like three, three components popping out because of triality. So this, uh, you, you, the commutators of SL with other things, you can do as matrix commutators with this object. And the 
important thing is that this is a this is a boost like thing because we have the split octonians we have um objects then that are null so all of the spinners that we have all of the y's and z's break up into null objects with uh actually this should be a u u plus or minus l or i plus or minus i l so all of the spinners get a null label like this and so the spinners break up into two sets. And those two sets of spinners turn out to be the killing duels of each other. And so you might be thinking like, uh, you might be thinking particles versus antiparticles, and that's almost true. Um, you might be thinking because the killing duel allows you to build scalars, you might be thinking um, uh, uh, bras and cats. And that's that's probably a safer way to be to be thinking about these killing duels. But it's a structure on the spinners only, not on the SO12-4. Okay. So. We've told you you want to decompose. That's a really mathy statement. We've told you you want to label everything with the division algebras so that you can be a physicist and keep track of things. And so now let's start doing physics. So what we want to do is put all of the leptons and electroweak theory, so all of the symmetries and the leptons, into E6. E6 is labeled with C prime tensor O because we've taken out all the color structure in, in the rest of O prime. And so the labels that we have are U and L from the split octonians and then all of the octonionic labels. So let's build some physics. E6 is SO91 plus this funny thing that splits the spinners into two sets. And um, uh, 16s of SO9, spinner 16s of SO91, two copies labeled by their eigenvalue with respect to SL. The SO91 we've already talked about wants to split up into the thing we've called the complex structure and what's left over, which is an SO7 one. And that SO7 one is the Lorentz SO3 one and the weak SO4. And the weak SO4 gets split up in the usual way into an SU2 left and an SU2 right. Um, so, Let's look at this now as physicists in terms of the labels. The labels for SO31 are IJK and then something that has to be a boost. And the only boost we have in E6 is the capital L label. So here's a quaternionic SO3, the pure imaginary quaternions, SO3 on the labels IJK and the capital L for the boosts. So here are the six elements of SO31. Rotations in the I, I, J, J, K, and K, J, K, I um, planes, and then the three boosts that go with it. And we can pick, I've labeled in red, uh, cartons for that. Um, so I could pick any one of these three to tell me what my orientation for spin is. The labels for SO4 are the rest of the octonionic labels, IL, JL, KL, and L. And here are the six elements that do the weak SO4 transformations. SO4 splits up into an SU2 left and an SU2 right in a canonical way by taking sums and differences of pairs like this. 
So when we pick the two Carton elements out of SO4, we get a Carton for the SU2 right, and we get a Carton for the SU2 left. So these are the symmetry groups that are in E6. Lorentz and weak, SU2 left and SU2 right. So now we look at the spinners and we can use um, the eigenvalues under the spin and weak cartons. This is the actually the SU2 right carton. So these are going to be the right-handed spinners. Remember that because we're um, our rotations are anti-Hermitian, they have pure imaginary eigenvalues. So to get real eigenvalues, I have to multiply by I. The uh, element of E6 that's playing the con that's playing the role of the complex structure is an element of SO2. We've chosen that to be X1. X1 is the thing with the label both one and you with the identities in both the uh, O and the O prime. And so this, these operations actually have to happen in the enveloping algebra because they're nested uh, commutators. But if I, with these operations, I can get real eigenvalues. And so I can look at the spinners and I can say whether they're eigenvalue uh, plus or minus with respect to both weak and spin. Um, so let me help you understand this table a little bit. Here, this Y1 plus, this, Here's, here's like a spin up, weak up uh, piece of an SO314. SO31 will have complex twos. So here's one element. Here's another element. This one is I times that one. So these two make a complex pair and these two make a complex pair. So those two complex numbers are a four of, of spin. And here's another four of spin. And, but they differ by what their uh, SU2 right eigenvalues are. Four of SO31. Sorry, what did I say? Spin. Four of the Lorentz SO31. All right, so then we can look at the other spinners. Let me take a, a, just a quick look at um, back looking at color. We had these threes and three bars of the color SU, SL3R. Those are labeled, those have these um, complex uh, split labels on them. And I want you to notice in particular that the eigenvalues of those things, so these are the lepton labeled ones, and these are the quark labeled ones. The eigenvalues differ by the factor of three. This is, SL is the U1 of hypercharge from the standard SO10 gut. It's the difference between the, how it acts on leptons versus quarks that give you the fractional charges and fractional hypercharges. This is, um, this is the translation of that operator into that operator from the standard SO10 guts into the E6 and E8 pictures. That sounds like a, a B minus L. <clears throat> I don't speak B minus L language very well, so sure. we can um, have a conversation about that. But sure. 
you say so, then it, yes, it probably is. B minus L is part of the is part of the uh, weak hypercharge operator. Um, can I ask a, just a quick a quick question? Yeah. Um, do you have anything in your model that uh, will differentiate between your SU2, uh, SU2L and SU2R um, so that you might end up with a chiral theory in the end? Yeah, in particular, the SU2L is in G2. Okay. And the SU2R is not. Not, okay, nice. And yeah. to go back to your, or your first question on, in, on that table that was showing the um, centralizers, you can find the two SU2s in different places in those tables. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to like see. So how hopefully some way you can knock one of them out. Well, you knock it out in the standard way. I mean, it really is an SO10 gut. Okay. So every, everything you know about SO10 guts, you're doing in here. It's just that the the quaternionic and the octonionic structure is labeling the things for you nicely. Um, so in particular, um, we have left-handed and right-handed spinners, um, according to whether they're transforming under the SU2 right or the SU2 left. Um, notice that the SU2 left automatically annihilates all the right-handed spinners and the SU2 right annihilates all the left-handed spinners. So you have the left, white, right projections happening as commutators in the Lie algebra. Um, and you can also tell because the SO, the, the weak SO4 had little letter, had little L's in all, all of the adjoints, that these spinners all have little L's in their labels. So you can tell immediately which are the left-handed spinners with have little L's and the right-handed spinners that don't. Um, so now- Again, know, I'm gonna jump in briefly, uh, Cole. That's also partly an answer to your question. The division algebra structure of the left and right-handed spinners is quite different. The right-handed spinners are quaternionic and the left-handed spinners are in the orthogonal complement of the quaternions. So that sounds like there might be an advantage to describing things in terms of octonions and not just dealing strictly with E8. Yes. Yes. Sorry, the, dealing with a division algebra version of E8. Of, yes, absolutely. Um, and in the paper, we talk a lot about the fact that these right-handed ones are in, there's a, in the, oh, let me go way up here. Um, when we were talking about moving through the magic square, here's the E6. Here's a, uh, this subgroup where you, where you just do um, C prime tensor H instead of tensor O, this is a, A5. And the right-handed spinners are in A5 and the left-handed spinners are not. And so it's, it's trying to understand how the A5 structure acts on the, on the rest of the E6, just as we see E6, E6 sitting inside E8, we're also seeing A5 sitting inside E6. And so the division algebras tell you like which things are in or out of which groups. So you could do it abstractly in the groups, but okay. Um, I should be trying to finish up. Um, so I know that Cole wants to ask about generations. So the, um, the SU2s that we talked about, let me go back up here. So here's SU2 left and SU2 right. We, to make this one generation of all of the particles, we picked um, particular carton elements in SU2 left and SU2 right. But if you pick, a different set of pair of carton elements in it. What happens is that 
where the eights go? Uh, leptons. That these eight things that I described as uh, weak up or down and spin up or down, they get mixed up with each other. And so the pairs still go together, but this is, um, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is a Y1 and a ZK, and this is a YJ and a ZI. If you pick a different carton, the Y1 goes, instead of with a ZK, it goes with a ZI or a ZJ. And so you mix these things, the spinners up with each other. And so it's really telling you that the generations are sitting on top of each other in this way that um, probably we, we hope eventually once we put some scales on things can uh, explain why the CKM matrix stuff works the way it does. Again, may I jump in briefly? Yeah. The eights are canonical. They're irreducible representations of SO31 plus SO4, Lorentz plus weak. But the splitting of the eights into something that you would want to call electrons and neutrinos depends on how you set up, uh, on, on, which I, on which carton elements you choose. And so you can scramble the identification of the basis of the eight, depending on exactly how you look at um, the Cartan element for spin and the Cartan element for, for weak. So um, later on, uh, you guys are going to um, bring in, I'm anticipating here, bring in uh, mediators. Um, so gauge bosons, uh, presumably. Yeah, um, and next slide. Okay, <laughs> so uh, are you some? Are you going to be somehow prevented from making the same argument for the um, for the gauge boson? So here, um, here somehow you're taking the same vector space, but you're you're saying that this is going to give us three copies. Um, is it um, because of you know the three um, independent axes basically? Um, in in the case of gauge bosons, are you going to be prevented from also making multiple copies of those gauge bosons? Uh, by a similar argument? You, you don't, so the philosophy of putting everything into E8 means you don't get to make more copies. So again, the gauge, the different gauge bosons also have to sit on top of each other. So let me just talk, give me one and a half minutes and then I'll try and answer your question. So okay. rem, remember that when I talked about um, decompositions, um, you take an SO group and you break it up into two smaller SO groups. And then you get this set of things that are representations of both of the smaller groups. So in particular, the SO7 one that we're looking at in E6 breaks up into Lorentz SO31, weak SO4, and four by four. So these four by four things here, they are listed. And these are if you think of them, looking at them in a row, they're vectors of SO31. Here's the I, J, K, and capital L labels um, that make them SO31 vectors. But if you look at them as, as columns, here's the L, K, L, J, L, I, L, SO4 labels. So these, are, these 16 things are simultaneously um, vectors of SO31 and vectors of weak. Because all of this is sitting in a Lie algebra, the Lie algebra is a Cartan subalgebra plus a bunch of raising and lowering operators. So all of these things will raise and lower spin and weak eigenvalues. Um, and so they're, they're trying really hard to be mediators. Um, and I, I won't say that we know exactly how this works, but we know that if you're looking at hypercharge, you're looking at SU2 left and SU2 right separately. But when you look at charge, you add the cartons of those two things and you end up really taking, instead of looking at SO4 as an SU2 left and an SU2 right, you're really looking at it as an SO3 and, and a rep of, SO, and a, of SO3. And so we're hoping that these are now labeled in a way that L is special 
So this one is trying to be the photon and it stays the photon across all three generations. But the, the things with labels IL, JL, and KL, then which of those are Ws or Zs depends on which generation you're talking about. So you don't get multiple sets, but they're, they're the Ws and Zs are, the three generations are like lying on top of each other or being reinterpreted depending on the generation that you're looking at. Um, if you do that, then the, if you go back and you look at, um, there's an SO64 that is Lorentz plus the SO33 for color. And then you get four by six things. So the four by six in the same way have both Lorentz and color, but vector labels. And so if these are the electroweak mediators, then you also get um, things that are like trying to be gluons, but they're in a vector rep rather than an adjoint rep of the SU3, the SL3R. And so you get six gluons in a vector rep instead of the eight gluons that you would expect in an, in an adjoint rep of the SU3. Um, so we're, we're still trying, I, I would say we're still working out the details of how this mediator stuff really, really works. Um, but I should be ending. So I just wanna summarize the E8, we've shown you how the E8 divides up into an SO12-4 and spinners. The, um, or you can also think of it as an E6 and six Jordan algebras that contain both these six, the six is the six gluons and the quarks and an SL3R. The E6 divides up into SO91 and two 16s of spinners, which will be the leptons, and this SL, which divides these up into two sets, the bras and kets, if you like. The SO91 divides up into a complex structure, SO31, and the SU2 left and the SU2 right, which you can mix up in different ways to give you three different generations. And, but this splitting also gives you the four by four that are both reps of Lorentz and weak to be the electroweak mediators. So we really feel strongly that this, uh, this particular real form of E8 contains all of the elements of the standard model in a natural way. And I will, um, I will end there. I do want to say that there are, there's a page of references in our slides. These are references from our group. We started working in 1986. Um, there's a, let me, let me take like two minutes to tell you a little bit of the interesting history. So here's the Jordan and Jordan and von Neumann, the mathematics of of generalizing quantum mechanics to Jordan algebras um, back in the 30s. Um, Freudenthal and Tietz were doing the magic square work in the, in the middle of the last century in Binberg. Um, Gersey was doing some early work, very early work with Octonians in uh, 1976. Um, Peter West, who is here, was here, told, uh, wrote to us and said he, he believes he's the first person who tried to put physics into E8 um, back in 1983. Um, but I think he was doing it in a sort of supergravity way. He can, he can probably tell you more about that. So he was doing that work then. I was an early postdoc in 86. So I was like totally focused on super strings and octonians and, and, E6 and Jordan algebra stuff at that stage. Um, and, but then I think the, what else did I want, who else did I want to particularly? So Saderwall, interestingly, Saderwall was also doing work back in these days. And we used to have 
we had a set of three conferences called Octo Shops. And Saderwall ran one of those. And I think he was doing really important work in this space at that time. And then things kind of like settled down. Everybody wrote like one paper on the, or several papers and then got stuck. Lisi, I think, got us all re-energized um, back in 2007. It was a conference that we were, somebody ran trying at, at Banff trying to understand Lisi's work that led us to meet Rob. And so we first uh, figured out, or Rob helped us figure out how to do E8 at, back at that stage. Um, and uh, and so then, then there's more, more recent work. And as I said, this, uh, this recent paper by Chester Moran and Rios is trying to put use the same E8 that we're doing, but a different E6. Um, so exactly how you, I think of it as almost like protein folding, how you fold up the whole standard model and stuff it into E8, like which E8 do you stuff it in and how do you stuff it in is, is uh, really finicky. Um, and it's taken a lot of people, a lot of time to, to try and get even to, to this stage of, of where we're talking about. And I will end there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Corinne and Tevin, for such a wonderful talk. Um, I suspect that there might be some questions out there. So um, if anybody has a question, please speak up. Um, I've got one right away, actually. Um, let, me, let me just say, Cole, before you go yes, on, yeah. if anybody knows more about the history um, and, and or wants to make claims, I would love to like now start piecing together what happened when. So please communicate with us via email and send us the, the references that you know about and the history that you know about. Um, well, uh, one thing I will mention actually, um, so one person I think I saw that he was here, Torsten um, Asselmeyer Maluka is here and he, um, he's got a paper on E8 um, as well. So he might, uh, he might speak up um, as well. Yes, please. And also communicate with us via email with the papers so that we uh, that, that, that we get the story all, all right. Torsten, did you want to say something? Um, uh, so, well, uh, David Chester has his hand up, so I'll, um, I'll let David have a go here. Go ahead, there David. Thanks for the talk. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand your model. Um, so you, you use SL3R instead of SU3? And you're claiming that the, the gluons are in the vector representation. So, are you using? Is this model different than the standard model? Because I guess technically a standard model is defined to use the SU3 gauge group. Or are you claiming that the gluons are in E8 with respect to some SU3, but they're just representations of SL3R? I couldn't understand which one you were going for. I'm saying it's not. I'm. Uh... I, I didn't. Be, I didn't follow the question. What is the difference in your question between SU three and SL three R? Okay, sorry. Let me try to rearticulate. So, um, I mean, the standard model uses the SU three gauge group, right? And you're saying that you SL three R is SU three. Uh, no, no, Tevin. Um, can I answer? Yeah. Uh, Tevin thinks that everything is complexified, and I'm not sure that's exactly true here. So, I'm not sure it's exactly the standard model. And certainly having six gluons is not the standard model. So I, I think that we are seeing slight variations from the standard model, but not really big ones. And whether they're observable, we're not at the stage of being able to predict that yet. And I think it was you who suggested to us that we really need an action. And you was it you the other day who suggested David. an octet? No, that was, no, that was David. David Griffith. Oh, okay. David well, Jackson, yeah, excuse me. Important. David Jackson, okay. That was David um, Jackson. So we're really excited about the the um, the Seder wall um, octic octic invariant octic yeah. invariant and trying to to actually now make an action that may be the piece that we need. So Cole, if that's true, your seminar helped lead us to the, the thing we need next. And David is here, so let's give a shout out to him for pointing us to that. That was David Jackson? Yeah, thank yes. you. 
Yeah, you guys have the fermionic sector though for the standard model. Definitely. The spinners certainly for one generation work uh, are a perfect copy of SO10 theory. Um, there is a, an extra, um, so normally we would identify uh, one generation with 64 real degrees of freedom, um, so, but there's two copies here. So do you have a way of, of interpreting what your second copy? So we're in, in the paper that we released, we, have, we talk about a, the Dirac equation and we talk about like, the, we believe the particles and the antiparticles like split um, between, and I'm not sure that we've got the details of that exactly straight, but it's like, if you have, we talk about above and below the line as being the, 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 two, the two copies. So if the electron is above the line, then the is a sum of a right and a left-handed thing above the line, then we believe that the antiparticle is the difference of two things below the line. So um, above and, so, and below are the two copies are killing duels of each other. The, so the, the question is whether the particles and the antiparticles both live on the same side or whether they live on opposite sides. Um, and, and our belief is that they live on opposite sides. And in some sense, you also have their charge conjugates separately. Don't use the word charge conjugates. Yeah, so I, 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 qual so I tried the, to qualify the, 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 it, but sorry. that's an internal. If, if you have to take the sum of a right and a left-handed thing. So if you make a particle as the sum, you have the sum and it's killing dual because you have to have both the bra and the cat to make the electron. But then the positron is the difference, but below the line instead of above the line. So the how, how the things fit together into Dirac pairs and their killing duels splits across the line in a complicated way. The short answer to your question, Cole, is that yes, we have twice as many things, but we think that's actually explaining language confusion um, in, in the existing description of particles and antiparticles and are trying very hard to turn it into a feature rather than a bug. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, uh, Tor uh, Torsten's got his hand up, so I'll, I'll uh, give him a turn. Go ahead, Torsten. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Oh, at first, thanks for for introducing me. And uh, yeah, my my work is connected with the uh, usage of the Carton matrix of the E8 uh, in four manifold uh, classification of four manifolds. So that is more more my connection to the E8. Uh, also, find some uh, representation theory in four manifolds directly. Okay, but but my question is now. Uh, the third line or the fourth line, uh, the red line, you had the Lorentz group, uh, and uh, as well as uh, the Lee algebra of the Lorentz group uh, sitting there. I first, first question is, I was wondering, that looks like uh, some kind of to go over the coleman mandola theory, uh, theory because you, you got the, uh, you got the Lorentz uh, symmetry as a space-time symmetry sitting inside of an internal symmetry, what you had an E8, that is my first question. Is it a, a problem? Is it a quanti no, no, not contradiction, but uh, you got a circumvent this a theorem in some sense. And the second question is, I was wondering the SL is a signlet in, 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 a, in, a, in a green line. Is it maybe connected? Uh, I, I'm not sure whether it's a really a spinner, so it can be, is it connected with a sterile neutrino or something like that? Did you think about in that direction? No, it's not you, you okay, I see you. Uh, okay. So the, the, the SL is not a spinner. Ah, it's not a spin, it, it's a scalar. It, well, it's, it's a thing in SO12-4. Okay. So it, it's a part of the spin rep. It's not a spinner. Um, so we do have both a right and a left-handed neutrino. Oh, okay. So, so, so in, re, in, the, in the spin sectors, we have both right and left-handed neutrinos. Um, remember that when in E8, you get a clean separation into SO12-4 and spinners. 
in the other places in the magic square yeah you get the spin group and spinners and some other pieces left over that are in so 12 4 but you can't tell that yet because you don't have triality ah okay yes. and sl is one of those it's really in so 3 3 which you don't have yet ah okay um and, and i i would say with regard to your coleman mandula question we're trying really hard to just ignore coleman Man <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think actually what we're doing is we have just SO just just a direct sum of Lorentz plus right. SO10. So I don't think we violate Coleman Mandula, but uh, it's um no, I no, really yes. worry about about no go theorems as oh. as as on some level trying to they they almost keep people from being creative. Right. And and so if you know if you have something that you believe is going to work, then it's going to avoid the theorem in some like subtle way. Mm. So okay. so we just don't think about it very much. OK, no, it's OK. <laughs> Maybe it's connected. You you, you make the splitting on the, on the level of Lie algebras, I think, and the theory may also argue much okay. about on a level of groups. But there's a difference now. Yeah. OK, it's so an exponential map between them. But uh, OK, I see. Is this um, but also, there, there is some. I I know that they say something about like over the complexes, yeah. and we're yeah. over like other division algebra. So there might be some something in there somewhere. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for the very nice talk. Thank, Thank you, Torsten. Okay, Jens, please go ahead. Hey, uh, yeah. Uh, so thank you uh, for sharing, like for giving us an introduction to your magnificent work that you've uh, presented there. Um, you haven't covered the part that I'm interested in, so I'm not sure, maybe it's an email follow-up. It goes more towards how you arrive at the Dirac equation. And uh, so I see uh, in the real two forms uh, that you do, that's your appendix B. Uh, I see how you got there from a Clifford algebra. And then uh, I have a question there, or I'm, I'm unclear about this enveloping algebra. Um, it's a similar, uh, what I thought a couple of weeks ago about the E8. E um, and there's a, there, I see how you're using the adjoint um, in the action, as an action, but then you have a, a condition on it uh, in, in B2. Yeah, I'm sorry, it, it goes in a, in a different way, but it, it, it comes from the octo-octonian construction because there are subspaces in the octo-octonians that are not power associative. They are crazy null spaces, non-commutative null spaces where A times B is zero, but B times A is not zero. And I mean, all, all kinds of crazy things. Um, um, yeah, so it, yeah. It's, it's like, <laughs> You know, uh -huh. it, it, if, if you don't do this in exactly the right way, you do get all kinds of crazy things. I would yeah, agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I, I think, and uh, we would be happy to talk to you over Zoom, you know, contact yeah, us yeah. by email and, and we can talk about the Dirac equation. But in the same way that we talked about the mediators here as being like um, the, the four by four that come from splitting the SO31 and the SO4, Mm -hmm. You also get some things from splitting the SO2 and the SO, the complex structure and the SO31 from each other. Mm -hmm. And those things are forming, I, we believe, the Clifford algebra that you use to build the, um, the Dirac equation. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah. and then this starts to look at, you know, you build up these, these, uh, these kind of layered Clifford algebras on top of each other, which, which starts to feel very coal like um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of what you're doing, but, but you're constrained by which Cliff, the E8 constrains what Clifford algebras you can build in a way that, that coal has more freedom um, mm -hmm. than, than we do. And so the, the, the Dirac, the Clifford algebra stuff you build used to build Dirac spinners um, is living in, in the um, two by four of, hmm. of this space. So the things that we called P's and M's in the paper, uh, sorry, the P's, the, the momentum are living in this space. 
And then there are other little pieces that break off, that have broken off. Um, and in fact, there's a, the, um, the two, let me write it this way. You have an SO2 and an SO31 Lorentz and an SO4 weak. So the four by four that sits between these two things are what we call the electroweak mediators. The two by four that sits in between Lorentz and SO2 is the Clifford algebra things. Those are the gammas. But you also have some things that are SO2 and SO4 labels. So there's another two by four there. And those are the right, this is, this is a complex label. And these are weak labels without Lorentz labels. Those things um, have the right kinds of labels to be the Higgs. Hmm. All right. And so the Higgs are the things that give you mass in the Dirac equation. Yeah. Let me give a slightly different kind answer of. following up on this, Jens. Mm -hmm. The short version is we have, as Corinne has just pointed out, these particular um, Lorentz vectors available to us. Once we have the Lorentz vectors, we can build the Clifford algebra. Once we can build the Clifford algebra, we can start talking about a Dirac equation. Mm -hmm. And we can okay. do that for SO31. We can actually do it all the way up to SO71 if we wanted to. And so there's a variety of, of, of quote unquote Dirac equations you could look for depending on which underlying dimension you want to pose it in. Yeah. Uh, when pulling all of this down from the octo-octonians, I'm wondering, do you know about any good literature on octo-octonians or split? Because I'm relying heavily on the computer and that's just, you know, <laughs> gives you some answers, but no real geometric understanding or any of that. There, there may not be any. I don't know of anything. You mean? Octo-octonians, yeah. like Ocroso. We, you know, we have our, we do the same thing. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we've got our own code for O prime tensor O and check everything on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll send an email. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. It's good to mm -hmm. see you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good do to see you too, Tenen. Do you have any uh, intuition about uh, why O cross O prime would be um, a good, um, the starting point, like as far as because there ain't nothing bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but why? Why would, um, for example, why would nature choose O cross O prime instead of O cross O or O prime cross O prime? Well, the O cross O prime is is totally compact, right? So you, you don't o. have any Lorentz boosts o cross unless o. you complexify it. I mean, more from a basic principles starting point, like as opposed to like we're using it because this is it gives us what we want. Is there is there maybe do you have any sort of feeling come from an algebraic or mathematical standpoint, like why O cross O prime would be special? I I mean beyond what we've just said, you need boosts to talk about the Lorentz group, right? And so you can't do this over a compact or over a complexified algebra. I understand. I mean, so I don't mean that um, because we know in the end that we want to get the Lorentz group. So, so then we would, you know, we could choose O cross O prime to get us there. But starting from, um, it, it, let's say I, we I didn't. Think it's, I think we it's didn't, the wrong, we didn't, for we us, it's the wrong question. It's that it's E8. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right, so you, you have to choose. We, we, it, it's we're, E8 is the biggest thing. I see. So I so that I can that one I I I've, um, I can uh, kind of understand that answer a, a bit better. But then again, like there, um, you know, as you mentioned before about the difference between SU2 left and SU2 right, there seems to be um, there might be uh, something with its parameterization in terms of O cross O prime, which. Um, you know, could be meaningful in the sense that, you know, perhaps it could distinguish between SU2 left and SU2 right. So again, as you go through the magic square along the path that, that Corinne was showing, Corinne, can you show that slide, please, near the beginning? Um, 
SU2 right shows up before SU2 left does. So, I mean, it, although you get both in the end, they don't come in at the same, in the same way. Exactly. And that's, and that's, is this not um, a statement kind of depending on their parameterization in terms of division algebras and split division algebras? So it's not purely, purely E8 on its own. It's the magic, it's the division, yes, it's the division algebra description of the magic squares. If you go through those yellow boxes, the way we argue in the paper, you start with the complex structure. You add this very special thing, SL, which is basically hypercharge. It's not quite hypercharge, but it's almost hypercharge. Then you add SU2 right. Then you add SU2 left. Then you add color. And all of that happens naturally as you jump between these yellow boxes. Right. So, I, so the reason why I brought back the the talk about division algebras was because um, I was asking why is O cross O prime special, and then Corinne's answer was that actually we think E eight is special. Um, and that you know that's a it's you know somehow especially algebra and that that's a good starting point. And I could understand mm -hmm. that except that I was I was adding in the rebuttal that. Um, you know, but you seem to also be using the parameterization in terms of O cross O prime, not just E8 on its own. Um, so it, it seems like, you know, you, you know, you're, you're still, um, you know, very much using this parameterization. Um, Absolutely. So much so that it's taken me this long to understand the distinction E8 is O cross O prime to us. So yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, maybe maybe an answer. I mean, it's like, like, why do you prefer dark chocolate over milk chocolate? I mean, it's uh, to some extent it's preferences, but but I think it's C prime tensor O is well. The, the paper really talks about it more is, is that, that this A5 here, which is C prime tensor H, is a really interesting one it, because it's got uh, SO5 one in it. So it has the complex structure plus Lorentz and it's got uh, the lepton spinners and it's got the S, the magic SL thing, and it's got SU2 right. <laughs> and the thing that centralizes that in E6 is SU2 left. So that SU2 left is going from H to O is, is that particular H to that particular O is putting that SU2 left in G2. And so it's, it's rather than asking the question about why O prime tensor O, it's that C prime tensor O seems to be telling us something important about electroweak. And then the extra going from C prime to O prime is this extra SL3R that gives you color. But the both the quarks and the leptons have to have to have this electroweak structure. So it's it's this the e, the the electroweak how the electroweak sits inside of this A five plus SU two left is this H to O is really an H to O structure, and then. That structure, since the quarks are also representations of E6 and A5, the electroweak just like you make it work on the leptons and then it automatically works on the quarks as well. Is, is that sort of answering your question? <laughs> uh, it, well, it, not exactly, but it, I think I'm, I've also kind of asked you guys an impossible question. It's, you know, it, like any, any, you know, it, maybe it's not impossible, but it, it sometimes it feels impossible. Like any any one mathematical structure you use, you can always ask, you know, why are you using this? Why should you know out of the infinite number of possible mathematical structures you could use, why would nature have chosen this as opposed to anything else? And it's um, you know, perhaps step one is for any of us to you know to, you know to actually get 
you know, a model that's um, choose a mathematical structure and get a model that's that's working and gives correct pred predictions. And then maybe step two then is to question why, you know, why this particular structure and not, you know, any of the infinite poss other possibilities. Well, you know, I mean, are you asking why God chose it? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, 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 think I, I, I don't know. Because, I think I kind of am. <laughs> because it allowed it. But, but, but I think, I mean, there's something interesting happening in this group of people who's here is that we all chose our favorite mathematical structure and we all chose which part piece of physics we're trying to stuff into that structure, yes. right? And, but, but, but the physics has whatever structure it has. And so some of us are gonna be right and some of us are gonna be almost right, <laughs> no, like no matter what, you, what we try. And um, so we, we've tried to stuff to stuff this standard model physics into a number of different mathematical structures and you know it either fits or it doesn't and yeah. and so why that it's because after many years of trying many things this was the one that's that seems to be working yes i, I understand and absolutely okay so i'll um i'll, I'll let uh, david jackson here have a, have a go go ahead david You're muted. No, uh, sometimes it takes me two. Sometimes it takes two tries. We'll see again here. Oh, it's not. Something seems to be frozen. Let me try this again. Okay, let me try again. There we go, David. I think you should be able to. Okay. Start. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thanks, Carl. And um, uh, thanks, Corinne. Thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a question about the um, three generations. Um, so the way I understand it, you're taking one copy of E8. And you're including the gauge groups in in one part of E8, and another part is being used three times over for three generations, essentially. Um, is, that, is that a fair kind of assessment? Yes. The okay. what, what we call a pod of spinners is an irreducible yeah. rep of SO4 plus SO31, and we're reusing pots using reusing the elements of those pots to represent spinners in different generations. Right. So, so the, the question is, I mean, in the, in the standard model, um, the gauge groups and the leptons and quarks are in two different kind of properties. So the gauge groups, you know, the symmetry is acting on things, and then the leptons and quarks, they don't actually act on things, they're just representation space. And you have this kind of E8 um, adjoint action. Um, would not, another way of dividing it be to put all the gauge groups into the E8 doing the acting, and all the leptons and quarks in the E8 being acted upon, um, kind of in, in, the, in two different E8s in that way, so that well, in principle you could fit in three generations in that E8 being, or, or would it be more Sorry, how do I fit that? in three generations yeah, in David, the- can I? Yeah. So David, um, yes, of course, you can try something else. <laughs> right, but, I mean, but, is there a reason but, not, but, to do, to that, not to try that or to believe that couldn't work? Well, but what we're seeing is that the, the symmetry groups are sitting in the two by two SO124 structure. So the magic square tells you the magic, the two by two versus the, the three by three magic squares tell you that the symmetry groups are in SO, the symmetry groups and the mediators are in right. the SO124 two by two structure. And then the, the spinners are just a rep of SO124. Right. And so, in any eight, the, the, the thing that you were trying to do of getting the, the symmetries to act on the rep is happening in the two by two versus three by three. And right. so within the one E8, you only have the one, the, well, the one rep and it's killing duel. Um, this is where Lisi ran into trouble because he right. only had the two reps. <laughs> right. And he didn't know. And so he was trying to get three generations, but he didn't have a third rep. And so then he then he then he mangled things. But um if you have the SO124 for the symmetry groups, you have only the one rep and it's killing duel in E8. So if you want to do what you're talking about is get three generations by looking at something bigger than E8. You want SO124 and three reps. And I I don't know how I don't know how to do, I don't know what nice mathematical structure ha, has that. 
<laughs> the, the structure that we, so it wouldn't be all of E8 acting on three different generations of spinners. It would only be the SO12-4. But E8 gives you SO12-4 plus one set of spinners and their killing duels, and that's, that's it. Okay. So the, the three generations that you have, um, do you have any ideas how they're kind of physically kind of related, how they would correspond to different generations of particles? Uh, so, for example, um, like, you know, muons and tails and so on, I mean, the second and third generation, would it just be some, I mean, how do you get from the second to the third generation or the first to the second generation? Sorry, how do you get from there? There's, we, we know how to take the same. You're, you're asking things. a physics question or a math question? Uh, I think it's a bit of both. I don't think that there's an operation in E8 that takes you from one to the other, if that's what you're asking. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the same eight things that get reinterpreted as different generations of part of the- so, like, so you would have something like a Tauon is made up out of, it could be expanded in a first generation basis as some combination of electrons and neutrinos, but that's nah. all that's actually going to play out in terms of predicting the results of, a, of a, either a Feynman diagram or an experiment, we don't know yet because we don't have an action. Right, right. Okay. But in but, sense, the, the but mathematical the answer is, yeah. is, is you take the electron and the electron neutrino and right. you combine those two things in different ways to get the muon and the and the tau on and the, okay it's 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 within within a single particle type the three generations mix up and always in the same way it's it's a very consistent thing sure uh, okay okay thanks very much thank you yeah thanks is there any way of seeing that they should have uh, different masses we don't have any uh, scales on anything at all Okay. We're, we're at the at the moment we're totally in the Lie, in the Lie algebra. So, but presumably when you put scales on the different scales of the generations tell you. We have some you other can't, ideas. You can't mix in particular ways. We have some ideas on that, but but at the moment, no. Okay. Fair I mean, it's it it's it's simple to like put H bars into a Lie algebra. I mean, you just put H bars and Cs and stuff onto the cartons in your Lie algebra, and then the eigenvalues get get physical, you know, have, have dimensions to them. Um, and because we've only got eight cartons in E8, we can't have very many different um, parameters. Parameters. You've only got, you've got probably only seven. But, um, whether some of those are masses and just like, it's like how the Higgs is going to work. There's some symmetry breaking that's going to put scales in that way. And we don't have any of that working yet. I mean, we can say these objects have the, the correct labels on them to be Higgs-like. Um, so but just, but that's just, also just, presumably the mechanism that's going to actually break the structure that we're proposing into particular generations. So, so the octarians don't help with the kind of no-go theorems about fitting three generations into E8. It's still not possible in an octonionic construction of E8. That's kind of you have to define what you mean by fitting three generations. You mean in, in terms of three sets of independent components for the three generations of within eight. Within mm, the we're certainly proposing something where they're not independent. Right. Okay. Yes. Sure. Sure. The, uh, the counting is <laughs> you, within E8. You can't get three separate generations. The counting can we get around? Work. Yeah. Can we get around the counting argument that that in some sense did Lisi in? No. Right. We're right. going. We're, we're we're going around it rather than okay. changing it. Okay. That's yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so Peter West has a question. I'm just asking, um, Peter, I, I need you to allow me to unmute you. There should be. Um, 
There we go. Did that work? It did, yes. yes. Please go oh, ahead. Okay. I didn't know about uh, your community until uh, Corinne uh, told me. So I thought I love E8. So I thought I'd drop in. I hope that's okay. Well, absolutely. Welcome. Uh, so uh, you, you asked me what we did so long ago. That was 40 years ago. That was a long time. And uh, I had to get the paper out to see what we did. Uh, I remember we did something. Uh, and now I realize what we did was we took, uh, we David and I were entranced by the fact that you had E8, E76, E5, E4, and the standard model. So uh, we wanted to exploit this fact. And uh, of course, we liked supersymmetry. So we didn't do any gravity. But what we said was maybe in 10 dimensions, you have an E8 supersymmetric theory, the uh, Yang Mills theory. And then we said, uh, maybe you can uh, break it by taking some of the extra dimensions to be a coset. So then we have the dynamics. So we worked out uh, on the coset uh, what was left below. And we used the fact that we had E7 and E6. And of course, we didn't find the standard model, but uh, we uh, found some things that uh, looked nice to us. So uh, I don't know whether we were the first, but uh, certainly we thought we were the first at the time. Um, and then we didn't work on it at all after that. Um, so, many, so many people like see that and, and then so many people have written like one paper. So do you do you remember what your what your influences were? Well, it was really this chain of, um, of course, we liked super n equals four supersymmetric Yang Mills theory uh, and its 10 dimensional analog. Of course, David invented it. Um, uh, it was really this chain of how you got to the standard model uh, going down by deleting nodes. Uh, and it was a bit like the previous speaker said, you know. Uh, we didn't just have one E8 because we had one E8 for the gauge particles. And then we had another E8, which was the fermions in uh, the supersymmetric theory. So I don't know whether okay. that Thank you, Peter. Uh, I had a question. Um, I don't think you uh, break the coleman mandula theorem because uh, your SO13, uh, it doesn't act on space time, does it? Or does it? It should, but probably not in a natural way. Well, we're in momentum space, I think. Yeah, but it doesn't, well, it wouldn't act on the momentum, would it? No, I it think it will, does. It will act on, yes, it will. I mean, Assum assuming the momentum is one of these vector reps of SO31 and E8, which is currently what we're assuming. Mm -hmm. Oh, your momentum then, is somehow in E8. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, I had a related question. You know, you have the generations and then you had the uh, gauge, mediate, gauge mediators. Does that SO13 act on those according to the, you know, the gauge should be vectors and the yes. other ones should yes. be vectors? Yes, yes. It really does? Yes. That's very good. Yes. Mm. I like it. <laughs> I think uh, you know it's, if if it acted on the uh, momentum, if you had momentum in there, and um, it acted on the momentum, then you would have trouble with the no growth theorem. But uh, if it's just uh, you know imposed from outside that it acted on the momentum, then you wouldn't have any trouble. Yes. So, we we don't have an answer to that at the moment. It's like everything that we've done in the course of our careers. It's like, as a physicist, we want as physicists we want something to happen, and then we, as mathematicians, we know like what is known and what is possible and what is not possible. And the case that we care about from physics is right on the border between what's possible, what's known by mathematicians to be possible and what's known by mathematicians to be impossible, physics lives like right on that place. And it's like uh, um, the analogy I think about is like with, with power series is like 
here you know it doesn't converge and here you know it converges and but what you care about is right on the edge where you don't know whether it converges or doesn't converge it's like mm -hmm. physics lives right there and so yeah coleman mandula is probably telling us that what we're doing is dangerous but i suspect that the universe lives like right on the place where you can just like weave, weave your way very narrowly um between you know like what are the assumptions of the theorem and you you don't quite violate you know you don't quite fit those assumptions and so you escape um but i don't know why or how well supersymmetry of course was the great escape mm -hmm. from that yeah oh well so, i will so this is i mean peter in many of the ways that that you thought about I, like the 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 fermions here are really behaving like almost like super partners it's like yeah i don't know um they're you might have a z2 the, the, the so124 is bosonic and the and the and the other and the extra spinner like things it's not i mean we tried doing super strings and the it yeah i'm i'm not saying anything sensible well i, I did wasn't going to say this but um you know i've worked for the last 20 years on something called e11 which is uh, e8 but much much bigger and uh, we wrote a paper where we said um, fermions are bosons. And it's partly to do with what you're saying of how, uh, and it's all to do with E8 and the representations of E8 and how some things uh, can appear, spinners can appear as bosons and the other way around. So I don't know whether it's got anything to do with that or not. So, so does, does that? give i mean the the construction that david jackson was asking about whether you had e8 and three reps of it for generations does that live in e, e11 oh well i i we never thought about that uh, I mean, <laughs> that's uh, we're having enough trouble with e11 without uh, looking for the but e8 e, e8 is inside it oh e eight's in it yes okay but space times in everything's in it actually <laughs> time and all the rest okay and, um, but it is just that thing you know you were asking about the representations and whether bits of e8 could be uh, seen as fermions. yes all right really good really good to know seen as fermions uh with the action on the space time so the, the the decomposition philosophy that i was talking about in my paper is that e11 then is e8 plus some centralizer plus reps Oh no, it's it's uh, it's one of these Katz Moody algebras. So it's something completely different. But it has right. E8 as its base. But I, I won't just uh, won't distract okay. you with that. It's okay. just that made me think of it. Yeah. Oh well, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for coming, Peter. Talk. Thank you. Okay, so Jorge Zanelli has a question or a new... Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I was, I was not aware of E8 and all the wonderful things that you can do with it. Um, I just want to comment that um, we have been working for some time on a, something we call uh, unconventional supersymmetry, where you have some of these same representations, um, including this SO31 uh, space-time symmetry with Lorentz symmetry. And uh, it, we work from uh, putting all these representations into a connection and write down a Lagrangian for this connection and turns out to be a supersymmetric system. So you get around the Coleman-Mandula uh, no-go theorems. And also you introduce automatically, almost inevitably, uh, the Lorentz group and therefore you introduce gravity. So these are, theories that include gravity and supersymmetry, but it's not supergravity. And it contains a more realistic uh, uh, spectrum of particles because the fermions are all spin one half fermions, not spin three half fermions. So I think that it has some of the 
features that your representations carry and uh, it's a uh, it's it's an an inaction principle starting from essentially a connection in a gauge group on a super algebra that's my comment so all right i think i mean i've always imagined that the next step of what we're going to do is to make this so 10 or possibly so 12 to 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 take our so 12 4 and put and put some of it as a, as a connection on on space time in some way or possibly put the put the whole e8 on as a, as a connection on something else so i i suspect that in the long run like what what we do will <laughs> intersect with what you do but i think we're looking at sort of probably just the connection part and not how it or you know fiber bundle things um but i i don't yet see how to connect what you're doing to what we're doing but but somebody will figure that out someday i expect well, I assume that if you have a Lie algebra or Lie super algebra, it's very natural to construct a connection. And with the connection, it's very natural to construct tur curvatures and Lagrangians. Yeah. So there's almost a unique way of doing things if you're giving a dimension, a space time dimension, then it's probably uh, almost a unique way to, to write down an action principle for that. Yeah. So you, you probably then know how to do the next step. Well, so we're we, trying. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so we didn't start in eight. We started with something much more uh, humble. We, okay. we started with an extension of the Lorentz group, or the, in let's say in three dimensions or in four dimensions. We start with the Lorentz group and con consider the supersymmetric extensions of that, and you get more or less the same representation that you have. So you have a bosonic part and the fermions coming in uh, in the connection in a very simple way. And you use that connection in that there you have a supersymmetric action that is not the standard supersymmetry. That's why we call the unconventional supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. It has all the other features of supersymmetry. The only feature that it doesn't deserve, it doesn't present is that you don't have equal numbers of bosons and fermions. You don't have pairings of okay. bosons and uh, so it's more or less like you have here. You, you have different numbers of, of both. Yeah. Cole, I'm going to jump in here just briefly and warn you that I'm going to have to disappear in a couple of minutes. Okay. Well, I think um, I think we might be. Um, Jorge, do you have any more questions, or was? No, was... that's okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, well, thank you everybody for for your questions. It, um, I think uh, now might actually be a really good time to to close things off. Um, so thanks again to, to Karen and Tevian for such a wonderful talk. Um, you know, you've uh, obviously really ignited some interest uh, by many people. Um, uh, yeah, and thank you, you know, thank you everybody for your wonderful questions. Um, uh, now in one month's time, um, Marcus Mueller will be speaking for us on quantum theory and Jordan algebras uh, from Simple Principles. Um, so we hope to see you again in, in about a month's time. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks.